Hello, and welcome back to Capitol Hill Ocean Talk on OceansLive.org. I'm your host, Kate Thompson, with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Right now, I'm delighted to welcome to the studio some terrific guests who will be sharing their perspectives on the role of foundations in ocean conservation. First up, we have Mark Spaulding. Mark is the president of the Ocean Foundation, a position he has held since the organization was created 10 years ago. Under his leadership, the foundation's budget has grown from 200,000 to 5 million per year, with a focus on improving the human relationship with the sea through diverse, carefully chosen strategies and projects. Also joining us is Heather Ludeman, a program officer with the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Heather joined the foundation in 2008 and currently leads the West Coast arm of its conservation and science program. Before that, she worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as a marine resource manager focused on the interaction between fisheries and other human activities. And she also served as the Presidential Management Fellow in the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. And last but not least, we have Dawn Martin, President of SeaWeb and Vice Chair of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation's Board of Trustees. Dawn wears many hats, also serving on the Board of Directors for COMPASS, the advisory board of the Center for Health and Global Environment at Harvard Medical School, the Smithsonian's Ocean Portal Editorial Board, and the steering committee for the Global Forum on Oceans, Coasts, and Islands. Thank you all so much for joining me today on Capital Hill Oceans Talk. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, it's, it's perfect in that Senator Whitehouse just mentioned on the last panel that uh, foundations play a very key and vital role in ocean conservation. So it was a great segue to our, our show today. So um, I'd like to get the conversation started with some background. Can you give us a sense of why your organization invests in ocean issues? Mark, let's start with you. Well, it's our name. Uh, the Ocean Foundation, and so we end up sp spending a lot of time thinking about how important the ocean is. All of our oxygen comes from there, how much food comes from there, it's 70 something percent of the planet and growing, and we don't pay enough attention to it. And so the creation of this foundation was to bring more attention to the ocean. Well, I, here it's your 10 year anniversary, and you of course started 10 years ago, so you kind of act like a portal uh, for all these philanthropists to come and say, we want to give money. What, what do you suggest? What are some of those projects that, uh, that you do that they give money to? So we work with individual donors, corporate donors, and government donors to do their philanthropy for them. And so we work with them, you know, they tell us what they want to do for the ocean, and we help figure out how to make it happen. If someone comes in and says they care about uh, shark finning, we find grantees who are doing very good work on shark finning. We also host projects. We have 52 fiscally sponsored projects at the Ocean Foundation all over the planet uh, who do work, everything from sea turtle beach conservation to documentary filmmaking. And then we have a handful of, of funds where donors can pool money and then we take care of the grant making uh, that way directly. So both global and, here, and locally uh, in the United States? That's right. Okay. Well, Heather, I uh, just wanted to point out, talking about anniversaries, uh, the Packer Foundation is 50 years now. Yep. Uh, that's pretty impressive. And I have to say, you know, moving forward back then, 50 years to think about ocean issues, that's impressive. Yeah, um, you know, as I was preparing to come here, I was going back into our grant files and realizing that the first grant that we made on marine issues was actually um, in 1968 to a marine lab in California. Um, so the work on oceans has been with the foundation almost since um, we began 50 years ago. Um, and, you know, the leadership for getting engaged on ocean issues has really come um, from the Packard family. Uh, I think a great example of that is David Packard, um, you know, really had a strong belief in the power of science and technology to improve people's lives. And um, before he passed away, he actually helped create the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute that focuses on deep sea research. Um, and so they've just shown immense leadership on, on mm -hmm. ocean issues. And I think, you know, 50 years um, into the foundation um, being around, that commitment still really um, is a, is a, is, you know, almost in the DNA of the foundation at this point. 
Right. Well, in Bari, and of course, the, the Monterey Aquarium are right there on the shores of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So we, we feel extremely privileged to have the Packard Foundation and in Bari and, and, and also the aquarium right there on the sanctuary shoreline. Um, so I, I think that foundations play this really, really large lo role, both globally and here locally in the United States. Um, so, Dawn, you're here. You have many hats that you wear, uh, and the ocean thanks you for it. Uh, but I, you're here kind of representing the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. So you know, what, how do they determine what their role is and what they need to tackle? Well, it's a great honor to be here, especially right now. There, our colleagues are celebrating anniversaries for their foundations. And while it's not an anniversary for the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, it is a great day for celebration. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we all heard that John Podesta announced the new rulemaking for the nominations of new marine sanctuaries. And that is a huge opportunity for us as an ocean community to bring people together, to bring communities across the country and across the globe, actually, to come together and to say, we really value and cherish these marine places, these special places, and we want them to be protected. And so this is the first time we've been able to do this in a couple decades, and we're thrilled about it. The National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation, in its earlier day, took on a variety of different issues, because the sanctuaries, the marine protected area concept was just sort of up and coming on people's radar screen. And um, now that we all know that sanctuaries and marine protected areas, marine reserves, are probably the best way to restore our marine ecosystems, to bring resilience to those fragile systems, the Marine Sanctuary Foundation is really focusing on uh, marine sanctuaries, on the nomination of new sanctuaries, and working with local communities to be able to provide them the resources they need so that they can protect their special places in their backyard. Well. We were saying earlier that uh, communities are such a huge part of this nomination process, and um, you do wonderful things within the communities in the U.S., but you also do the global work as well. How do you find that balance um, in helping international MPAs, but also making mm -hmm. sure that we take care of our, our, our home turf as well? So, uh, Heather, can you talk to us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, um, we've been working in the United States for decades, um, and we continue to work in the U.S., um, and I think that there's still you know, we've made a lot of progress um, on really setting up the United States to be a leader on fisheries management, and so making sure that we sustain that um, is really important to us. And then to, you know, take new tools like marine protected areas um, and see the progress that we made in California and Oregon, and we're still committed to that um, work at home. But we do do a lot of work um, overseas as well, and we really see that as um, important, and that a lot of the similar approaches that we're using, the context are different, you know, the ways of working. Um, you know, you definitely need to be um, paying attention to kind of the different cultures, um, economics, and social elements mm -hmm. of the places you're working. But we've still had a lot of success with um, marine protected areas, um, you know, reforming fisheries. So we mm -hmm. try to do a bit of a balance. Um, but we're definitely looking um, to where are those, those challenges globally, not just within, in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum from 50 years ago, when the Packer Foundation first started <laughs> giving funds out for, for ocean issues, we now seem to have a lot of ocean-type foundations um, out there and with competing issues, competing funds. How do you work together on things and, and, and issues that have come up, like climate change or ocean acidification or, or, large, or large issues like that? That's a great question. We all of us belong to uh, a marine conservation program that is part of a group called the Consultative Group on Biological Diversity. Mm -hmm. And we uh, have our annual meeting in, in person every year. We have monthly phone calls. We spend a lot of time seeking ways to collaborate with each other. Um, we often pool funds uh, so that no single foundation is exposed on a, a single investment. Um, and we frankly, try and bring new things to each other's attention uh, on a regular basis in order to get more of the mm -hmm. foundations involved in different uh, subjects, whether it's ocean acidification or underwater cultural heritage or now uh, the problem of, of uh, threat of seabed mining. Mm -hmm. Well, with each of these issues, uh, Dawn, I'm going to address this one, this one to you. 
uh, later in the week at, on Capitol Hill Ocean Talk, we're going to be talking about the health of the ocean in, in many different ways, the ocean itself and then on our health as, as humans. Um, are you optimistic about the state of the ocean and where we are right now? You know, um, I am, and I am for a number of reasons, and not the least of which is the fact that we have uh, now an administration, and we have over the past several administrations, a growing focus on ocean issues. Um, as you recall, the beginning of John Podesta's talk today, he hearkened back to the first World Ocean Conference that uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore held. And since then, I've seen some growing momentum in terms of the awareness around these issues. When I started back in 1990 working on ocean issues, um, I had to work on the Clean Water Act because that was the only way we could make a connection to people around the ocean, and it was estuaries because that was the NIMBY issue. It was mm -hmm. in their backyard. Today, I see, you know, the the sort of the growth in the foundation's focus, focus on ocean issues, the growth in resources, the opportunity and interest in people leveraging their work together as um, a very hopeful opportunity. And the fact that we are now realizing that through the protection of, of the creation and the expansion of sanctuaries and through marine protected areas, we're seeing some of our marine resources rebound from some of the threats and the damage that we had uh, gives me hope. And I think um, it's why everybody continues to come to work in these issues and come together. Um, Heather, do you feel like you're doing enough? Do you think the Packer Foundation is doing enough? And if you do, how do you measure that <laughs> success? That's kind of a loaded question. But, uh, uh, get out of here. Yeah, right, 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 right. <clears throat> um, I mean, there's always more to do. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, just building off of what Don was saying, um, you know, we are optimistic because we have seen these systems rebound. I mean, we, we're rebuilding our fisheries in, in the U.S., um, but there is always more work to be done, and so we really try to identify, you know, where are um, there areas where we think we can make progress, um, that we think the interventions that we can bring, either policy, governance. We also do a lot of work on um, creating demand for sustainable seafood, so mm -hmm. using markets um, to drive change as well. So we really, you know, to the best of our ability, try to bring multiple interventions to an issue, understand which is getting traction. Um, and then internally, we have a lot of you know, um, like strategic plans and outcomes that we measure ourselves um, to. So we try to be quite rigorous about that and also to continue to learn and to push that learning out to the field. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I hope, I hope that we're doing <laughs> enough, but I, I encourage others yeah. um, to join mm -hmm. the Ocean Funders Group mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of excitement right. and energy there. Right. So, Mark, I'm just going to ask you a quick question. So, with new sites, new nominations potentially coming coming down the pike, uh, you know, when people hear the word sanctuary, oftentimes they get a little nervous or scared about what that might mean. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you think there's a good balance of use and protection mm -hmm. uh, in these special places? Yeah. Obviously, we have about 100 years of experience in creating sort of our national park system mm -hmm. on land. <clears throat> and it has protected you know, something around 22% uh, of, of available resources uh, and examples around the country. Um, we don't have anywhere near that in the ocean. We have about one point mm -hmm. something percent, almost 2% perhaps. And we haven't done enough to protect enough in the ocean. But even when we have done protections, for example, the National Marine Sanctuaries Program is very much focused on uh, minerals and, and uh, oil and gas exploration and things like that. You can still go fish in many of the National Marine Sanctuaries, which is a, a wonderful balance to find mm -hmm. and figure out how to do right. And I think what we have to do going forward anywhere in the ocean is find that balance so that we're not taking too much good stuff out and putting too much bad stuff in to the ocean. Yeah, and creating that, that excellent balance, including help from the communities themselves mm -hmm. uh, as, as advice and work together to make that special place the most special that we can make it. Um, so, Dawn, um, how do you see the role of ocean-centric foundations changing? Uh, and into the future. Uh, will it kind of stay the same, or, or are you going in a different path? Well, I, I hope we continue to grow. 
as a community. What I've seen is this tremendous growth in not just the resources that are made available to the community, but the, um, the knowledge that is being shared by foundations. There's a, you know, almost a new industry being built up in terms of the, um, the scientific community cooperating with the foundation community, with the business community, because of a lot of the work on markets. People coming together to realize that this is a resource that it's in our best interest to save <laughs> um, from an economic perspective, from a livelihood perspective. And people are seeing that and they're putting their money where their mouth is. Um, One of the things we're hoping for is a little bit more diversity. Um, for about a decade now, we've done a survey of all of the funders together with the, the CGBD group I mentioned. And last year, for example, that the group of funders spent about $250 million on marine conservation. Okay, About 80% of that was for wild fisheries management and doing a better job on overfishing, illegal fishing, et cetera, et cetera. But if you think about it, you know, that means there's not a lot of money left for other things. And so one of the places I hope our foundation community can grow and expand is into other issues. How do we think about ocean acidification, seabed mining, mm -hmm. uh, coral bleaching, uh, temperature change, sea level rise, and other things like that, and not just the commercial fish product sector and what's happening to it, even as, as crucial as that may be, and how significant overfishing is as a threat to the ocean over, ocean's health overall. Well, this forum, Capitol Hill Ocean Week, uh, is extremely important to be able to talk about these issues, bring it out, have uh, ocean leaders along with congressmen and others meet to discuss the issues. Uh, Heather, what do you think, how, how do you think Chow does when it comes to getting those message out and having everybody discuss the, the issues. Yeah, well, I love coming to Chow. I mean, um, so we're based in California, um, but it's just a really great opportunity to connect um, with old friends and meet new ones um, and really understand kind of where the ocean community is going mm -hmm. um, and to also understand what kind of issues are starting to resonate. Um, you know, we spend a lot of our focus on fisheries, but um, especially with climate change coming down the pipe, mm -hmm. understanding um, those impacts and kind of what are the potential interventions to addressing. You know, I think Chow is a perfect place um, to kind of broaden our learning and also um, just to connect back with each other around a common goal and vision. And I might just add to that, too, that the U.S. has been a leader on so many issues on the environmental front, that having it, uh, an ocean-focused conference right, like this right mm -hmm. in the heart of the nation's capital, to be able to bring together the, the agency leads on so many of these critical issues, as well as the policymakers and now the White House, too, really mm -hmm. engaging, is really exciting. And it's critical, not just for what we do here in the U.S., but so that we can transfer some of the knowledge, some of the lessons learned to our colleagues and friends and communities around the world. Well, I have to say, I'm, I'm very, very excited about the, the future of sanctuaries and marine protected areas and working with communities uh, across the country and world to ensure that our ocean is protected and um, conserved. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Uh, you are an integral part of this fight, this battle, to ensure our ocean is around for future generations to enjoy. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thanks for okay. doing your work. So thanks once again to my guests, Mark Spalding and Heather Ludeman uh, also. And uh, the Ocean Foundation is sponsoring a partner of this year's Chow. You can find them online at oceanfoundation.org. So stick around for the next panel, Climate Realities, Preparing for the Worst, followed by our final show of the day featuring one of the most exciting events of the summer, the 38th voyage of the Charles W. Morgan, a restored 19th century whale ship that's making one last tour of New England's historic ports. That's coming up at 2.30 Eastern. Thanks for watching Oceans Live at Chow, and we'll see you then.